Hey, hey everyone, back again. Today we're going to talk about Deleuze and Guattari's notion of the war machine. But before jumping into that, if you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way that makes them accessible. So if you're new here, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and you'll see videos I release every single week. If you're not new here, you know, like, share, subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, that would obviously help me out a lot. You can help me out monetarily if you want to do that via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. If you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. If you want to see mostly pictures of my cats or on Twitter at David Guineo. I haven't figured out Twitter yet. Uh, eventually I'll have a more active presence on there. But anyways, um, if you found this on YouTube and you're watching the video for it, you, you'll be able to find just the audio in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads. Or if you found this in podcast form, you'll be able to find the video on YouTube. So yeah, don't waste any more of your time with that stuff. Let's talk about the war machine. Now I want to be quite upfront about this in that what I'm providing is a pretty rudimentary introduction to this idea. And the reason that I'm saying that is because it's a very complicated one and it's one with lots of holes in it and lots of uh, room for interpretation. Now to get the best sense of this term, you really have to go and read the entirety of A Thousand Plateaus. But if you're strapped for time, if you just read the two chapters or plateaus, the treatise on nomadology and apparatus of capture, you'd get a pretty good idea of what's going on. They do add some of more to it throughout the course of the entire book, but anyways, that's what you'll need. Now, for that reason, I'm going to be just kind of covering it in as clear a way as I can. And the way to do that, or I think in my mind, the best way to do that is to say right off the bat that the war machine is something that exists always and forever, which is kind of a very strange thing to say. But the war machine is something that allows for, for Deleuze and Guattari, for possibility and for transformation to occur. Now, it has a kind of originary point, which if anyone's actually paying attention, you'd say, well, if it has an originary point, how can you say it's forever? How can you say it's always been around? Well, that is because its condition or its coming into possibility was contingent upon a few factors that weren't necessarily always met at that time, which didn't mean that it wasn't around lurking, hidden in the shadows between the bushes or uh, in those sparkling eyes we might see in the night before a predator were to get us. But the war machine is that which allows for, quite simply, possibility. Now, I'm going to elaborate quite a bit on this to give you a more fruitful understanding, but just as a kind of introduction, it is a site and a condition for possibility. Now, they sketch it to be in opposition to the state. So the state is something that rather than opening up potential, rather than opening up possibility, tries to foreclose it, tries to limit possibility. Now, I want to add a little asterisk here and say that in certain state formations, there is actually a kind of predilection for or a, a proclivity for movement and for transformation, especially under certain capitalistic states or states geared towards that those interests where they don't see any kind of limiting <laughs> functions occurring. Instead, they try to seek out new markets all the time and new possibilities. And that is certainly an issue in Deleuze and Guattari's work is trying to figure out where does good uh, possibility reside and where does oppressive possibility reside. And I think that the war machine can help us untangle this. Where the types of possibility we see forming under like late globalized capitalism are a kind of oppressive form that seek only to, to use one of their buzzwords, deterritorialize for the sake of deterritorializing. That is to root up just for the sake of rooting up. And of course, this is accompanied by a number of re-territorializations that are quite oppressive. But anyways, don't want to get too much into that. Just to say the war machine is that which is opposed to the state. And it is something that precedes the state. Now, the state 
isn't totally uh, oblivious to the war machine or doesn't know how to actually work with it. In fact, the state is the apparatus that is particularly effective at grasping or capturing the war machine, taking it in and saying, we can use this, this, this logic, and I'm just using the term logic here quite loosely, but we can use this logic for our own ends. And it is at that point that the war machine becomes associated with what you might have automatically thought, war. It is only at that point when the war machine as a site for possibility for transformation is appropriated by the state that it becomes destructive in the form of war for the sake of war. Now thus far I've, I've been kind of spotty in telling you exactly what the war machine is and there's one of the reasons for that is that they aren't totally clear about it. But they give us a number of what they call axioms that describe the war machine's uh, kind of origin. And it originates with nomadic people. So if you don't know, nomadic people are opposed to sedentary people in that they don't have a set place to live. Instead, they go where ever food might be or where the weather might be better or whatever all the time. They don't have a set home or a set territory that they are attached to. So it emerges within nomadic people in a kind of strange way and we can't possibly trace the genesis of this thing because we don't have all the kind of archaeological knowledge that that we could possibly have. But in any case, the war machine is something that is almost appropriated by nomadic people although it is nomadic people that give it its kind of face, its form, its in even its substance, the war machine is something that nomadic people take on to actually ward off the state. So the state, as I've kind of briefly characterized it, being that thing that forecloses possibility, that limits possibility, that tries to overcode or just code certain elements of the world. It says, oh, you're going to have this plot of land and you're going to have that plot of land and we're going to make everything very clear and concise and if you don't follow these directions you're going to be punished. Now the war machine tries to ward off that happening because it never settles down with a kind of set system of beliefs or values or whatever or a kind of directional patterns or impulses or any kind of sedentary living for that matter to actually allow the state to crystallize. Now, it has a kind of deterring function to deter the state to keep it from coming. And in that way, it actually embodies certain elements of the state. And one of the really interesting points that I think Deleuze and Guattari make in A Thousand Plateaus is that there is a kind of misguided belief that nomadic people or quote unquote archaic people were somehow other or completely different than what was seen under certain state formations. Whereas Deleuze and Guattari are quite clear that in fact many of the elements that we find within states and for a long time believed to be exclusive to states is now being overturned in that we're learning more and more about pre-state people and the way that they lived, how they organized, and there were these hierarchical functions, there were these other kinds of um, the forms of maybe even currency, exchange, things like that. And they were, that is Deleuze and Guattari, were way ahead of their time when they were talking about this. There was not all the kind of archaeological excavations had been done since that time. Uh, you know, they were really predicting things from what was a pretty limited set of knowledge about uh, archaeology, about these early civilizations. So they give us three axioms for the war machine, and they are as follows, and I'm going to elaborate on them after I present them quickly. Number one, the war machine exists outside of the state apparatus, which should be pretty clear. Number two, it emerges in conjunction with, and I'm using the word conjunction loosely here, in connection with nomadic people, and because of that, it shares certain predispositions that these nomadic people have in terms of their spatio-geographic conditions, their arithmetic or algebraic conditions, and their affective conditions. And I'm gonna break those down 
in a moment. And the third axiom, which is a difficult axiom to reconcile, but I'm going to do my best. The third axiom is that the nomadic war machine is the form of expression to the form of content, which is what they call itinerant metallurgy. Now I'll explain what that is in a moment, but just for now, let's put that on the back burner. So axiom number one, that the war machine exists outside of the state apparatus. I feel like that should be pretty clear with what I've said so far, so I won't cover that anymore. Number two, it arises in connection with nomadic people in terms of three very specific components or aspects of nomadic life, and that is the spatio-geographic aspect of their lives. Now Deleuze and Guattari are clear that the way that nomadic people occupy space and, in a sense, navigate space is very much different than the way that the state does, where the state, you know, tries to organize space to tell what space is meant for what, and so on and, and so forth. It re-territorializes every time it deterritorializes. Now they oppose that with nomadic living that is just pure deterritorialization. There's no home. There's never a point when it's like, oh, we've arrived and this is our place and that's it, because then they would cease to be nomadic people full stop. Now it is true that nomadic people will often take the path of least resistance when it comes to moving through the world, you know, geographically. They will, by virtue of that, they will create routes, they will make paths, which might resemble or appear to be a marker of a kind of human intervention upon the earth that puts humans outside of the domain of nature. But the Liz and Guattari are not going to buy that argument at all. They're going to say that all animals house some kind of territorial function. You know, cats are quite ter territorial. Any other animal is quite territorial. But that territorialization is not one that is put in the service of a kind of higher order or higher authority or kind of organizing principle. It is something that is done with an immediate connection to the world, to, to the rocks around us, to the trees around us, to our climate, to our uh, everything that essentially comprises us as humans. Now, that puts us here into the second aspect. So we've gone from the spatio-geographic now into the arithmetic, arithmetic, or algebraic, which might seem strange. You might think, well, I would associate math with a kind of state system that wants to number things, wants to organize things. And again, Deleuze and Guattari are quite clear that there are elements of nomadic living that precede the state, of course, but that can then be found in the state again. So one of the ones that they give or provide is what they call numbering numbers, or the act of just um, compiling things in terms of various vectors, various uh, understandings about direction, magnitude, anything like that, which all people must have to some extent, if I can quite brazenly just appeal to Kant for a second, we seem to have some kind of faculties for these abilities to organize, to, you know, have some knowledge of what is going on around us in terms of a kind of numbering. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to know whether or not, you know, a few hunters can take down that mammoth, unless you knew how many numbers you were going to need, how many hunters were going to be necessary to take down this thing. And there was then a kind of understanding of that logic of numbering. And the war machine is able to use that for its own end, not for the crystallization of a state that will then code those numbers or use those numbers to code and to organize the world, but instead for the sake of possible transformation, for opening up for what they call becoming, specifically becoming nomad, becoming animal, becoming, becoming other. And thirdly, at least the third aspect here that they introduce, is the effective, that is affective, component of the war machine. So when nomadic people exist in the world, they are going to be affected quite literally by that world, and by contrast, they are going to enact themselves upon the world. So in the case of these paths being constructed, that is through looking for the path of least resistance, and then it forms various little routes and roads or whatever, there's a kind of carving of the earth which is an earth that then acts itself upon them. 
So there's a kind of give and take relationship here. And one of the ways that they accentuate this point is that the human is not a kind of totalizing, uh, homogenized thing. Rather, that world is going to affect the human in different ways on different parts of them that really trouble the idea that they're just this one homogenous thing, like the human, like this just singular thing. Instead, they are a multiplicity and they are enacted upon in different ways because of that. So for example, and this is maybe a silly example, but if you live in a place where fishing is gonna be more required, your body is going to adapt to that in ways that are different than if you have to hunt for your food, for example. And that demonstrates that the human is going to be enacted upon differently. And now the war machine is a site for possibility because it fosters these kinds of effective potential, what they call an outpouring of emotion, essentially, which is its weaponry, which is the way that it kind of approaches the world as a possible, you know, threat at times and as a friend, something that can be loved, something that can be embraced enjoyed, you know, insert any other thing here, essentially. So those, that's my way to kind of break down that second axiom that it emerges, the war machine emerges with nomadic people. And then finally, the third axiom, and one that's probably the most difficult, because you have to have a grasp of the entire book, is that they equate the form of expression or correlate the form of expression as the nomadic war machine with what they call itinerant metallurgy, which is the form of content. Now, itinerant metallurgy is a very interesting idea, and it's not one that they really build upon, even though they give us this kind of brief axiom, just saying that. But there is recent research suggesting that metallurgy wasn't something that was born within states, where you know you had state formations that could then uh, organize people to go dig up a mine, get metals, you know, attribute value to those metals, and then ship them wherever. Instead, there's more and more evidence growing that nomadic people and people who didn't exist within the state were actually bringing metals to the state. And itinerant in this way means uh, to travel from place to place. So they were nomadic, they were traveling from place to place, and they were metallurgists distributing these metals, whether or not they had the same meaning to them as to the people they might have been selling them or giving them to, who knows. But this is just one of those things, one of the parts of this book that they don't elaborate on as much as I think they should have, that is, is anyway, still super interesting. So the war machine is appropriated by the state. That is, the state tries to take it on and to use it for its own, to its own ends. And it is only that point that the war machine becomes associated almost exclusively with the act of war which is obviously not something it likes because it wants to create, not to destroy, which is what wars <laughs> wars often do. But this even itself can take on many different forms. You could have wars conducted between states, for example. You could have uh, wars conducted within states for the sake of more control, whatever. Uh, but they really stress the point, and this is something that I think we can credit Guattari with more than Deleuze, but this is a point that Guattari picks up on in everybody, his text, Everybody Wants to Be a Fascist, in which he says that fascism emerges when the type of power we associate with it creeps into every single walk of life. And they attribute that to the war machine because the war machine is a kind of a logic that fascism appropriates by, you know, encouraging transformation, encouraging individuality, encouraging development and growth in order to instill control to instill that kind of battle-minded uh, aspect of the war machine into these little, these liminal spaces between people's own effective potentials, thereby making them prone to this kind of fascistic impulse, which is kind of the extreme form of the war machine. And that, I guess, more or less covers it. It's, and I want to stress really just a basic introduction to this term. You really have to go read the text to get more of it. I've also done an episode on apparatus of capture specifically with someone who is much smarter uh, than me that you can go and check out. And I've covered a thousand plateaus if you want more on that. And yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.